Rabbi and I go back a long way. Um, uh, it's a great honor uh, to welcome and introduce Rachel Kadish to students from UCSB and some faculty members, as well as our community members who have all come out um, to listen to her. Her novel, The Weight of Ink, that followed from uh, two earlier novels, From a Sealed Room in 2006 and Tolstoy Lied, A Love Story in 2007, has garnered nearly universal acclaim seen by the many awards it has received, including the National Jewish Book Award, the Julie Award Howe Award, and the Association of Jewish Libraries Fiction Award. There are many here tonight who have read the novel. How many of you have read the novel? Raise your hands. A few, right? <laughs> um, but I know that there's at least one person in this audience tonight who told me that after she read the novel a second time, she immediately began reading it a third time. So you'll have to catch up with her. <laughs> Kadish's uh, stories and essays have been read on NPR, have appeared in the New York Times, Salon, the Pushcart Prize Anthology, and in an extraordinary essay in Quartz Magazine in which he retells the story of a Japanese diplomat in Kovno, Lithuania, who saved her family by providing uh, them and approximately 5,000 others travel, visit, uh, travel vis vis visas for G Jews who fled Krakow. The Weight of Ink is a complex historical novel that interweaves the stories of two women, Esther Velasquez, an immigrant from Amsterdam to London in the 17th century, who becomes a scribe of a blind rabbi, and Helen Watt, a historian who is immersed in Jewish history. There is mystery and suspense in this novel that begins with the discovery of a trove of letters and manuscripts in London, which take her and the reader deeply into the century, uh, in, into the 17th century, and the Murano world, and the Sabbatian comp, uh, controversy with a compelling verite that is seldom achieved in a novel. Kadish wrote an extraordinary account of her novel in the Paris Review in April of 2018. Uh, I want to quote only one short paragraph from that essay about the purpose of historical fiction. She wrote, historical fish fiction isn't just to add a pleasing emotional embroidery to what we have already, what we already know about history. It is to tell the dangerous stories the human truths that fly in the face of propriety or power. We've lost too many stories. Historical fiction undertaken with integrity is an act of repair. Lives have run through the sieve, but we can catch them in our hands. Certainly, in these days, we need more historical fiction like The Weight of Ink. At the conclusion, at the, conclu at, the <laughs> at the conclusion, I'm running for political office. Um, <laughs> not really. Um, at the conclusion of her presentation uh, and discussion with you, she will sign copies of her novel, which will be available for purchase from our good friends at the Book Den. And tonight, for the first uh, 10 people who buy The Weight of Ink tonight, we are also giving a sort of twofer. You get a free copy of Ruby Namdar's From a Burnt House, which of course Ruby was a speaker with us last year. So please now welcome Rachel Kadish. That was the best introduction ever and you should run for office. You should have a political party. What should our slogan be? Books save the world? Can we start with that? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of people here. Wow. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, if you have trouble hearing me, just wave like mad, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you and pick it up. Um, 
you all have already given me the nicest welcome and you've been so apologetic about the rain and I want you to know that I came from the polar vortex. It was one degree a couple mornings ago, minus 17 wind chills, so this is fantastic. Um, when writers are invited to speak, we are generally expected to talk about our books, and uh, I will, I promise, but when I have the chance for a conversation with a group of people, I usually like to try to talk about the big picture. Why fiction? Why write it? Why read it? Why spend our time on made-up things when we live in a world with a lot of real problems that need our attention? Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about why I write, a few of the reasons, and along the way I, I will eventually get to talking about my book. I'll read a few very short excerpts and then we'll have time for discussion. So the question of why I write for me is, is definitely not just an academic one. I mean, I spend a lot of time asking myself, why? Why? Why do I do this? Sentences are hard. Paragraphs are harder. And then your friends ask you, you know, how's the novel coming? Is it coming fine? Is this the same novel you were working on last year? Three years ago? Five years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, sometimes I don't know whether anyone will care about a bunch of imagined characters. Um, but I do it, I write, and uh, for a few reasons, and I'm going to talk about a few. So the first one is just the basic pleasure of finding the words to say it. I think that putting words to an experience is a basic human satisfaction. Um, we've all had that moment of seeing something beautiful or seeing something absurd. You see, you see a beautiful sunset. You see someone walking down the street and their umbrella gets blown inside out in a way that strikes you as funny. And that impulse to want to find the words to put on it. I mean, yeah, we could snap a photo, but, but very often you're sitting there thinking, how would I describe this? How would I describe it to my friends? And I remember being in high school, those intense friendships where I would stay up late at night trying to think how would I how would I explain this or describe it to my friends and I see even you know my kids my teenagers they're not just snapping photos they're they're putting it into words um, and uh, Milan Kundera said that being in love is like having a camera on your shoulder and wanting wanting to record everything you see and show it to the beloved person and I think that that narrative impulse, that impulse to want to share what you're seeing with other people, it, it spreads out across all kinds of love, not just romantic love. And I think that being writer, a writer is a way of being in love with the world. You want to take what you see and put it into words and share it. And I remember having this impulse even as a kid I remember watching my grandfather, uh, and my grandfather was, uh, he was a, a Holocaust survivor. He was um, uh, older, uh, he was an older father and older grandfather. So he was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, in 1904. And uh, he, uh, so he had all these stories, and he would come and he would sit, he would sit in his chair. It was his chair, it wasn't anybody else's chair. And he had these hand gestures, and I remember standing by his chair and watching him. And each of these gestures meant something very different. And I remember, even as a kid, thinking, I want the words that describe the difference between these different things, because it was a whole vocabulary. You know, there was, there was this. You, you don't want to be on the receiving end of, of that, right? And then there was that, which meant somebody else was, uh, was going to catch it. Um, and then there was that which is when you're taking your troubles to a, a different uh, power. Um, and so that's one of my first memories of that impulse to, to find the words. But also you should know that writers have their tricks. And when a character is going to be important later on, you plant a seed early so that the reader gets to know the character and is familiar with them. So you have now just met my grandfather. He's going to come back. So look out for him. Um, another reason I write is, for me, it's the best way of telling the truth, which may sound ridiculous because most of what I write, not all, but most of what I write is fiction. So what is fiction? It's a pack of lies, right? That's what it is. Um, my dad likes to say that he has three children, two of whom are gainfully employed, one of whom is a professional liar. Um, my dad is very proud. He's very proud. But, but it's true. Why? I mean. It's a pack of lies, right? You pick, up a, you pick up a novel, you know it's not true, you know none of this actually happened, right? The, the, in my case, the historical bits happened, but not the, you know, the character parts, those are fictitious. Um, so why care about that? Why is that something that's worth our time? Um, for me, um, 
I think that one of, one of the things that art does is tell the truth, the human truth, what it's like to be a human being. Um, and um, so what do I mean by that? Well, when I teach writing to, um, to kids, to young kids, which I sometimes do, I start with a question. I say, okay, um, your friend just got a present, and it was something you really wanted. Somebody gave it to your friend. What do you say? Um, any kid who's over about three or four years old knows what they're supposed to say, so they'll parrot it back. They'll say, that's so great. Glad you got it. And I say, okay, so that's what you say. Underneath that, what do you think? So the answer is, well, I'm thinking, I wanted that. Okay, Under, underneath that thought, what are you thinking? And the answer is, how come they gave it to her and not me? Do they like her more than they like me? Okay, underneath that, what are you thinking? Well, do they like her more than me because of that time that, you know, and it goes on and on. And you go all the way down, all the layers into the sub-basement of the human experience, what it's like to be human. So we don't just stay on the, the top social level. We go to the real honest, the truth of what we feel in these moments. And if you read Tolstoy, that's what Tolstoy's doing. He's going all those layers deep. And I think that that's what good art does. It shows us something we recognize that maybe we didn't even want to admit about how we feel about things. Now, for me, I can do that best in fiction. Maybe if I were wired differently, I would know how to do it in memoir. But I think for me, if I were going to write memoir, I would be, um, I would say, okay, I'm going to tell the whole truth, but I'd be protecting somebody. I, for one thing, I might protect the people I love, not that they have deep, dark secrets, but it's, it's their privacy, not mine. And then what if I said, I'm going to tell all my secrets, I will, you know, show all my flaws. Well, maybe I can't see all my flaws. You can see my flaws because you're outside of me, but I can't see my own. So, um, okay, what if I wrote biography? What if I said I'm going to write uh, the story of Eleanor Roosevelt? Well, I would have access to, um, I actually don't know if she kept journals. Did anyone know if she kept diaries? But if she did, I would have access to those diaries. I'd be able to say, this is what she wrote in her diaries, and this is what other people said about her, and maybe this is what she said in public. But I wouldn't have any kind of honest access to what it felt like to be Eleanor Roosevelt, what she thought underneath all those layers, right? But if I write fiction, then I don't have to protect anyone. And I feel like I have more access, and no one can sue me. They don't like what I say, because they're pretend people. So for me, that's my way of accessing the truth. And that's why I say that fiction, which is a pack of lies, for me is a way of telling the human truth. Another th reason that I write is to figure out what I think. There's a Henry James quote I love. It's, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? Um, that's how my mind works. So when something is puzzling me, something's bothering me, and I have to figure out what I think about it, I have to write. I have a, a nephew who has an engineering brain, and when he doesn't understand something about the world, he solves it with equations. He, he builds the new widget. For me, I have to make up stories, otherwise I can't really metabolize anything. So um, I tend to start writing when something is bothering me. Um, so for example, years ago, there were a couple of things that were um, kind of rolling around in my mind and bugging me. One of them was a quote by Virginia Woolf in A Room of One's Own. And Virginia Woolf raises the question, what if William Shakespeare had had an equally talented sister? What would have been the fate of that woman, a woman with that kind of a capacious mind and, and talent in that time period? And Woolf's answer is very succinct and very depressing. It is, she died young. Alas, she never wrote a word. Uh, that bothered me. Not because I don't think it's, it is the most likely, I mean, it is the most likely outcome for a woman with talent in that time. Given the realities of women's lives, r restrictions on access to education, on time to work, um, the realities of domestic labor, childbirth, all of this, the most likely fate for a very talented woman in the 17th or 16th century would be that she would die without writing a word or painting a painting or composing a symphony or whatever it was that she had in her to create. But I couldn't help kind of shadow boxing with it, thinking, well, what if, what if? What would it take for a woman like that not to die without writing a word, not necessarily a literal Shakespeare sister? but a talented woman in that time. Um, I thought, well, for one thing, she'd have to be a genius at breaking the rules. 
I thought, okay, that's fun. I'd have fun writing about a character like that. So I thought, I want to write a novel that reaches back in time to ask this question of what does it take for a woman not to be defeated when everything around her is telling her to sit down and mind her manners. So, um, okay, I need my characters who don't mind their manners. I'll have fun doing that. But I also needed a time period. I needed a time, I wanted to pick a time period and it just had to feel right. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I figured I'd know it when I found it. Um, I also wanted to find a situation that was like a, a frontier mentality, the kind of because that's when they let women do things that women aren't normally allowed to do. It's kind of the Rosie the Riveter scenario. So there's no guys here right now who have the necessary skills, so we'll let you do this right now, honey, till the right guys come back. Um, so I needed a scenario like that. So I started, um, I was down at Stanford for this um, really wonderful fellowship, and I started f sitting in on history classes and looking for a time period. And I became fascinated with the, uh, by the 17th century Jewish community of Amsterdam. Not, when I say I didn't know anything about this history or this community. I didn't know that the Jews of Amsterdam in the 17th century were um, Sephardic, not Ashkenazic. They were mostly refugees from the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions. I didn't know that Amsterdam at the time was the only place in Europe where you could safely, openly be Jewish. They called it the New Jerusalem. And in fact, there were only a very few restrictions you had to obey. You couldn't discuss atheism, but nobody could discuss atheism. This was a time when people were literally ripped limb from limb for discussing atheism in public. Um, you couldn't debate religion with non-Jews. Other than that, there were not, uh, th there might have been one more rule. Other than that, you had your religious freedom. Um, and there was an influx of Portuguese uh, Inquisition refugees in Amsterdam, so much so that Saying someone was Portuguese was a, a euphemism for saying that they were Jewish. It's, it's kind of like people now say, you know, she's from New York. Um, <laughs> so she's Portuguese meant she was Jewish. Um, another thing I didn't know about this community was that this was the group that excommunicated Spinoza. I didn't know that Spinoza was Jewish. I had never taken a philosophy course. I was very intimidated by philosophy. So I was sort of uniquely unqualified to write this book, except that I was reading Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein's book, Betraying Spinoza, which is an amazing book. And she talks about this community excommunicating Spinoza. And what I learned was that excommunication, even though it sounds like a really terrifying word, was not the big scary thing it sounds like to us now. It was a slap on the wrist in that community at that time. It was, you're excommunicated for two weeks till you say you're sorry and don't do it again. That's what excommunication was up until Spinoza. And when they kicked him out, they gave him an absolute fire and brimstone ban. It's God's fury will smoke against him. Lifetime ban on Spinoza. Lifetime ban on anyone who has contact with him. You can read this in translation. You can Google it, find it online. And when I read this text, you know, every now and then you read a really old document and you hear the human emotion in it. And I felt their fear. You could hear how frightened they were that they'd finally found this perch of safety, and here comes this guy, and he's sounding, frankly, atheist, and he's definitely debating religion with non-Jews, and he's about to mess it up for them. And when I read this, I thought, my God, I know these people. These are my people, because even though it was different centuries and a different scenario, I thought, these people are refugees. I grew up around refugees, and there was something that was so familiar from the, the Holocaust survivors I grew up with, the sense that um, this beautiful, fierce desire to rebuild, but this very brittle sense that and the slightest mistake could mess things up, the slightest thing could go wrong, and we'd all be back where we started. And it was that tension, and you could feel how frightened this community was, and I thought, I want to write something about these refugees in the 17th century Jewish community of Amsterdam. And then I read about how um, a rabbi from that community approached Oliver Cromwell to try to get the Jews readmitted back to England. Uh, there actually were some Jews in hiding in England. They would be, you know, every 50 or 100 years, they would be um, outed and kicked out, and then some families would come back in. There were about 200 Jews living in London. They wore cross they pretended, pretended to be um, Portuguese, Portuguese Catholics. Um, but this rabbi asked Cromwell to officially readmit Jews to England. And Cromwell couldn't fully get it through Parliament. It's sort of a long story. But there was this tentative moment of, okay, so it's going to be okay to be openly Jewish in England. 
And I thought, okay, there's going to be a little mission of um, a rabbi and his household coming from Amsterdam, and these are my fictitious characters, to help re-educate the Jews of London and bring them back into the Jewish fold. They did not want to be outed. They did not want to be re-educated. It was a very tense uh, situation. They wanted to be left alone in hiding, pretty much. Um, and I thought, okay, here's my frontier scenario. So I have my rabbi, he's blind, so he needs someone to scribe for him, to read and write for him. And he's gonna go with his household, two orphans who live in his house, a brother and sister. The brother, for reasons I won't get into, is not gonna be able to scribe. There'll be a housekeeper, um, and there will be this young woman. And she will, because she's scribing for a blind rabbi, she'll have access to books and learning um, that she would not otherwise have access to. So I just started writing. I don't outline in advance, um, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk about why. Um, I, I don't and can't work that way. So I tend to start writing, and everything is an act of improvisation. So I thought, well, um, I have this character, and I have a feeling she has something to confess. I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm going to start writing. This was the first thing I wrote, and it actually stayed, uh, which I, normally the first 20 things I write I cut, but this stayed. And I'm going to read it. It's just a couple paragraphs. June 8, 1691, 11th Sivan of the Hebrew year 5451, Richmond, Surrey. Let me begin afresh, perhaps this time to tell the truth. For in the biting hush of ink on paper, where truth ought raise its head and speak without fear, I have long lied. I have not to defend my actions, yet though my heart feels no remorse, my deeds would confess themselves to paper now as the least of tributes to him whom I once betrayed. In this silenced house, quill and ink do not resist the press of my hand, and paper does not flinch. Let these pages compass at last the truth, though none read them. So um, the voice you just heard is Esther Velasquez, and she ends up being the main character of the 17th century portions of the novel. So she grows up in that same community that excommunicated Spinoza, and she goes with the rabbi and with her brother and, and the rabbi's housekeeper to London. And she, um, because she's scribing for the rabbi, um, she gets access to these books and to time to study and be around discussion of text. And the more Esther reads and studies, the more she feels there are questions that she's desperate to ask, questions that in that age were forbidden. Uh, but she can't keep herself from asking them, no matter the danger that they could bring down on her household if it was known what she was writing or to whom she was addressing her letters. Now, um, if you've read the book, you know that the book actually opens chapter one uh, 350 years later in London. What I just read was the brief prologue. But the, the story really opens in London. Esther's voice has long since been lost. We're in contemporary London with a woman named Helen Watt. Helen Watt is a professor of history. She's a non-Jewish woman with a complicated and very personal reason for her passion for Jewish history. She is only 60 years old, but she's in poor health, and she has, among other things, a hand tremor, which means that she should not be handling delicate documents. Um, now, writing is funny sometimes. And sometimes you do things, and you don't always realize right away why you're doing them. And I always thought, well, Helen has a hand tremor. She just does. That's how I imagined her. Um, it was only halfway through when I was writing the book that I thought, oh, here's the reason I did that. I've always loved the, um, the line that... Um, in Hebrew, it's Imesh Kachach Yerushalayim, Tishkach Yemini. It's translated as, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning. Um, and to me, there was something so powerful about the idea of someone who has devoted her life to not forgetting. That's what historians do, right? They, they bring the past, they, they, they make sure we remember the past, um, yet she's forgotten something essential about her own life, and because of the tremor in her hands, she's barred from touching the, the literal manifestation of the history, the thing she most wants to touch. She should not be touching those papers. So the novel begins when Helen's received a phone call from a former student of hers. His name is Ian Easton. She doesn't remember him at all, but he tells her that he and his wife Bridget, um, he, well, he says he took her history class years ago, and he remembers her, and he's calling her because he and his wife Bridget have inherited a 17th century building that was in Bridget's family 
family, and they're renovating it to turn it into an art gallery. They've had a, um, an electrician come to put wiring in, and he tried to thread it through the old carved wooden staircase. But when he opened up the old carved staircase, he found shelves packed with very old documents uh, that look like they might be in Hebrew, and then there's something that's another language, it turns out to be Portuguese. Um, but he can read that, that many of the letters are signed with the name of a rabbi. So he thought he would call her basically to say, you know something about Jewish history, can you come here, get these papers out of the house so we can finish our renovation. Helen is skeptical that the papers have any value or that they're even 17th century, but she agrees to go and it's going to be Helen with the help of a graduate student named Aaron Levy who are going to begin to examine the documents that Esther Velasquez left behind. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read just a couple paragraphs of Helen first arriving at the house. This is when she first sees the papers. There, on a small card table beside the window, was a single cracked leather-bound volume. Beside it lay the two pages Ian had told her about over the phone, the first items his electrician had removed from under the staircase upon discovering the documents. For an instant, she allowed herself to stare at the pages, taking in the thick textured paper she dared not touch. Then, at the counterpoint of two alphabets on the page, the Portuguese lettering that led from left to right, interrupted by scattered Hebrew phrases that ran in the reverse direction. Slowly, she read and reread. Ian's voice, coming from just behind her. Over there, he said, and pointed. She lifted her eyes. There, in a dim corner at the base of the staircase, untouched by the blinding light of the landing's windows, was a small panel that had been forced open. Ignoring Ian's tentative offer of help, Helen approached the opening. Lowering herself slowly to the floor, her cane trembling heavily under her weight, she knelt before it like a penitent. She stayed that way for a long time, her hands pressed to the cool floor, and a great heaviness nearly overcame her, as though all her years had suddenly taken on physical weight. For a long while, she simply stared at the crammed shelves, breathing very quietly. Then finally, Knowing she should not, she lifted a quaking hand to remove a single page. A moment only. The page, astonishingly, rested unharmed on her two outspread palms, like a bird that had agreed for just this moment to alight there. So I wrote that, and now I had Esther, and I had Helen, and I knew that there was going to be something in the interplay between past and present um, that was going to change the lives of the characters in the present time. So the book I wrote, I started improvising, and I ended up with a structure. It's structured like a mystery. It goes back and forth between the two time periods. We're with Helen and Aaron. You'll, you'll meet Aaron in a moment. And they'll find something in the documents that doesn't make sense to them, something that maybe upends everything they thought they knew about 17th century women's lives uh, in that community. And they'll think, who would have written this and why? And I'm writing that, and I'm thinking, who did write that and why? So then I go back to the 17th century, and I start writing to try to figure out what Esther was up to. Um, that structure made a lot of sense to me, and I love the, I love the structure where you go back and forth with history um, because it felt very natural to me. Um, because I have a lot of memories of being at my, uh, my family's dinner table, and the conversation would be, that's when we were in Russian prison, past the salt. And you sort of, you know, history just sort of flies by, and you think, you either just let it go, and you think, okay, whatever that was, or you chase it down. No, wait a second, what was that? What was happening in the Russian prison? And then if you chase it down, you have a responsibility to it. What do you do with that history? And do you let it change you? And do you let it change how you act in the world today? So I love that tension between past and present. I started writing and research. Um, someone uh, asked me at one point, well, how long did you research in advance before you started writing? I can't work that way at all. It's an interactive process. To do all the research in advance would be like saying, okay, I'm gonna swim a mile by first standing on the shore, doing all the breathing and then I'll do all the swimming, right? You would pass out, you, you know, you kind of have to alternate. So it would be, I'd be writing a meal scene and it's 1658 and I have to think, well, what's on the table? And what are the utensils and what are the table manners? What are the characters wearing? That clothing was, was heavy, what was it made of? And they're looking out the window, what's growing in the garden outside the window? Before, before you get to that, what's the glass they're looking through? 
They couldn't make big sheets of glass. They had those little mullioned panes, and they were kind of wavery. They couldn't make flat glass like we have now. So I'd research all these things. And let's say I, I, you know, I had my books of 17th century medicine and sanitation and you know, all kinds of things. So let's say I'm looking up what they're wearing, and I have my book of 17th century fashion. So I'm paging through that, and I find an, um, an etching of women uh, when they, uh, sort of high society women, when they went out to do something a little risque, like going to the theater, or not completely done up and they didn't want to be recognized, they would wear those black velvet face masks so no one would know who they were. So there was an etching of this, and I thought, oh, this is wonder wonderful detail. Who would wear a mask? And for those who have read the book, I thought, oh, Catherine. This is not a big spoiler. Catherine is sick when you first meet her. So when Catherine is ill, she would wear a mask because she, she can't do herself up the way she would otherwise want to. So then that gave rise to the scene in Hyde Park with Catherine. Um, and um, I had a lot of fun starting from ignorance. I went to rare manuscripts rooms. If you ever have a chance to go to a rare manuscripts room, just ask to see something really old. It's amazing. They'll bring, they might co confiscate your pens and pencils, and they might w make you wear gloves. But they bring out these documents, and you'll have 400-year-old documents, and someone has doodled faces in the margins because they were bored then, just like people are bored now. And, and faces look the same, and it's the most wonderful humanizing moment when you look at this old document. Um, I went to a document conservation lab, and I learned about iron gall ink, which is a kind of ink they used to use that um, some forms of it over the centuries um, are not stable, and they burn their way through the paper, but just where the writing is. So if you can imagine, I mean, for for a word nerd like me, this is like, wow. You know, the, the words burn their way through the paper. So you have pieces of paper that are like lattice work with the, the burn, the words, the letters just burned through with uh, word shaped holes in the pages. Um, I was a little insanely meticulous about the research. I have stories I could tell. And if my kids were here, they would make fun of me and tell some stories about some of the lengths I went to for research. But, um, I was really meticulous about it for two reasons. One is the reason you would imagine, which is that, um, look, if you've ever been reading a book or watching a film that has something to do with a place you've lived in or a profession you've worked in or something like that, and they get even one detail wrong, there you go. As the whole thing loses its cre credibility, the illusion is broken, and you lose your trust in it. So I wanted to avoid that happening as much as possible, and I had people who were experts in the various fields, you know, read it for historical accuracy and for the philosophy and everything. But beyond that, um, I had another reason that I wanted to be very uh, careful to be absolutely historically accurate, not to have anything that wasn't plausible by the known facts of the time period. I thought, when I finish this novel, if I ever finish this novel, people will say to me, well, Esther Velasquez, finding a way to live a life of the mind in the 17th century, well, that's a pretty story. But we know it didn't happen. We know nothing like that happened because we know the names of the six or seven women who wrote anything approaching philosophy in 17th century England. Um, I could bore you to tears and I could tell you the names of all of them. Uh, we know that um, they were all, with, with two exceptions, um, everyone had to be all three. They were all um, aristocracy, wealthy, and childless. Two exceptions, Anne of Conway aristocracy and wealthy. She had one child, but she had migraines and someone watched her child for her. And when she recovered from her migraines, she wrote her philosophy. Afro Ben was not aristocracy. She was wealthy and childless. Everybody else, aristocrat, wealthy, childless, certainly not Jewish. Certainly not, you know, not poor and Jewish. Um, and uh, so I thought, well, people would say to me, obviously, we know that nobody did this. Um, and I wanted to be able to say, yeah, of course, Esther Velasquez is fictitious. I made her up. But how do we know somebody didn't try to do this? You have centuries of people who, because of their gender or their race or their ethnicity or their um, sociological background, are banned from expressing what they have in them, whether it's, uh, whether it's thinking, whether it's painting, whether it's music making, whatever it is. And most of them get defeated by that because it is really, really hard not to. But people try to do what the grass does. They try to grow up through the pavement. Most don't succeed, but some do. And just because something is against the rules does not mean it's not happening. When history puts a foot on people's necks, they break the rules. And, you know, on a very personal level, I grew up knowing this. My, my grandparents were law-abiding citizens in Poland, Poland until August 31st of 1939. Then they lied, and they cheated, and they bribed. They got thrown into prison. They got out. They got arrested again. They made their way here, and a couple years later in the US, they became law-abiding citizens again. We call that surviving. 
So just because people say something is officially not supposed to be happening, I know it doesn't mean it's not happening. And for anybody to, um, to live a life of the mind, for a woman to live a life of the mind or a life in the arts at that time, she would pretty much have had to do it under a man's name. We've recently learned that um, much of the music we thought was written by Felix Mendelssohn was actually written by his sister Fanny. Um, there's a, a, something I quote in that um, uh, essay that uh, Richard read from, which is Hilary Mantel, uh, who wrote the Wolf Hall novels, said that the historical record is what remains in the sieve after the centuries have run through it. But we know what the sieve catches, right? It catches those lives that were deemed important enough to record, which usually means white Christian wealthy men. So what about all those other lives that ran out through the sieve? Um, it doesn't mean they didn't happen. Are we so sure that now it's 2019, we've already found the identity of every woman who ever wrote under a man's name? I, I see no reason we, sh we should assume that we found that. So I wanted every piece of the novel to be plausible, um, historically plausible, because it's part of my larger point I was trying to make, which is take this history seriously and take seriously the notion of a woman having a place in it. Um, so another reason I write, and I think I'll just do two more, Another reason I write is it helps me look at issues that I feel torn about. Um, and you all may have do much more clear thinking than I do, but there are issues that sometimes I think, well, I look at it this way, I look at it that way, I can see both sides. Um, and when I put an issue into a piece of fiction and I let characters argue it out, that's a way for me to sort of walk around all, all angles of it and look at all the sides. Um, now, if you spend any time in academia or in the arts these days, you will stumble across the question of who does this history belong to? Who gets to tell a story? Who does this artifact belong to? Um, and this is one of the issues that comes up between Helen and Aaron. So <laughs> the notion of conflict brings me to Aaron. Um, Aaron Levy, he's the third major character in the book. He is um, the graduate student, or as they say in England, postgraduate, who helps Helen with the manuscripts. They hate each other. And that's really fun on the page. All the things that we try to avoid in real life, like conflict, difficulty, are really fun on the page. Um, and uh, so Aaron Levy, he's American, he's Jewish, he's a son of a rabbi, he's arrogant as anything. Everything has always come easily to him. He's good looking, he's been a star at school, um, and um, one of his ex-girlfriends gives him the nickname Teflon Man. She does not mean it kindly. Everything rolls right off of him. Um, and he comes to England, he takes on, he's gonna do the most ambitious history dissertation topic he can. He's gonna trace connections between Shakespeare and the Jews of Shakespeare's era. He comes to England to do this and he stalls. For the first time in his life, he is failing. He cannot find any new connections. Every, this is Shakespeare. Everybody has mapped this already. This is a very well scoured field. And he thought he was gonna come in and be a star and he's in free fall. And if you know anything about the British system, they really leave you alone. So if you're a postgraduate and you're working and you're stuck, you're really stuck. So here he is flailing, not wanting to admit it. And his advisor says to him, hey, I have a colleague who needs help with some documents. Helen Watt, can you help her out? He jumps at the chance, um, except that what he quickly discovers is though, even though he was brought on board because he reads the necessary languages, he reads Portuguese and Hebrew and, and all of this, um, Helen doesn't trust his translations, she double checks everything he does, and he feels like she treats him like a mechanical arm because she also makes, asks him to turn the pages for her. She's not supposed to be touching these pages. And he gets very uh, frustrated and there's a moment when it all blows up, so of course that's what, I'm gonna jump right in there and read from that. Um, oh. Um, Permission to swear in the synagogue? Is that all right? Granted, all right, I got, this is good. Um, I, don't, um, it's funny, I don't always read the same sections, but I, um, I read from this section when I was at the Melbourne Jewish Book Fair in Australia. And I never know who's in the room, and I, you know, so it, if I'm gonna read from this, I try to remember to say, okay, you know, there, there's a swear in here, is that okay? So I did that, and I got to the end, and the moderator just said, we're all still waiting for the swear. You know, that doesn't even count as a swear here, so. <laughs> Okay, so this is Aaron and Helen. You could have hired a child to turn pages for you, he said. You should have. They work cheaper than postgraduates, and they don't mind being ordered around by someone who hasn't a vestige of consideration. Even better, he continued, not caring anymore, wanting only to fire back at the blanched, haughty woman to whom he'd been enslaved because of his own desperation. Children don't challenge Brits who get their kicks out of dissecting other people's histories without the least. She cut him off. 
I have as much right to research Jewish history as you, perhaps more, if you count years of, he didn't care, he wouldn't care, spoken like an old-fashioned colonialist. He had, at intervals throughout his life, burned himself badly through an inability to control his temper once he got started. He could go years without an incident. He could go so long that he came to believe his Teflon Man moniker. And then, without any warning, he himself could see, he would erupt as though there were no such thing as a consequence. Thus far, he damaged himself very little, allowing his temper to fly in the faces of those who held only paltry power over him. So he'd been able to proceed with full confidence to the next mentor, the next study group, leaving in his wake only a thin trail of muttering TAs or resident advisors whom he would never use as job references and whose ill opinion of him would never reverberate into his future. Now he felt it happening with Helen Watt and had no wish to stop it. He wanted only to blow the flames higher, to see how high they could rise, how quickly this whole enterprise, the entire fantastical trove under the staircase, this golden chance to save his stalled academic career that gave this woman such intolerable power over him, could blow to ash. Faint pink patches had arisen on Helen's cheeks. Mr. Levy, you are on very shaky ground. Bullshit, he got up out of his chair. Bullshit, he said again, as though it were necessary to repeat this from his new vantage point. The words strengthened him. The way her nostrils flared, as though everything about him were odious, strengthened him. This story, for example, belongs to the global Jewish community. Florence, Sabbatee in crisis, he spat the words. Rabbi sending advice across Europe. Yet you go along with Jonathan Martin's plan to skirt the Freedom of Information Act because you don't want to share this with Jewish scholars. You don't want to share it with anyone. He was arguing against his own interests now, and he didn't care. All he cared about was humbling her. And something else, something seductive, suddenly flurrying inside him, the prospect of succumbing to reality. There, he'd thought it. So he wouldn't get a PhD. He didn't need Shakespeare. He didn't need Helen Watt. He didn't need drizzly England and its sodden cues and waterlogged personalities. He didn't even, he didn't even need history. He could make his life without it. The only pinch of regret he felt as he spoke on was at a momentary image of the documents packed so carefully on their shelves in that stairwell in Richmond. The tide of lines on paper written by a steady unknown hand speaking to him across the fraught silence of centuries. He blinked it aside. Um, I'm going to um, jump ahead to just one last reason that I write. Um, I write, I write because it makes me feel safer in the world. So um, remember my grandfather? This guy, right? So I grew up with my grandfather telling me that I couldn't trust anyone who wasn't Jewish. I know why he said it, and I know that he said it out of love and protectiveness for his grandchildren. He wanted to spare us what he had been through when his um, colleagues betrayed him in Poland. I would be foolish to just dismiss what he said um, and uh, to not understand the dangers he's talking about. Um, and I have also been arguing with that comment my whole life. My grandfather died many years ago and I'm still having the argument. Um, and I'm still having the argument because I take seriously what he said, but at the same time, what I feel is that we're only safe if we do trust each other across those lines. Um, when I say trust, I don't just mean trust like a passive thing, like here it is in a black box, it's trust, you put it on the table, hope that works out. Right. I think of trust as a verb, as a muscular thing. Trust is something that requires work. It requires explaining, it requires listening and listening again, and giving people a second and third and sometimes fourth chance. So not just saying, well, obviously you don't understand, so I'm going to retreat to my group over there and I'm gonna be in my silo, and you're gonna be in your silo, because I fundamentally think that's when the world becomes the most dangerous. Um, and for me, some of that work of trust, of building and creating trust, happens through fiction. And the reason I say that is that trust happens through empathy, right? A basic sense that I, you can't trust me if I don't care about you. If I don't care what happens to you, or your kids, or your parents, why would you trust me? Why would I trust you if you don't care about me, right? Trust has to be based on empathy. Fiction, the entire crazy house of cards of fiction is built on empathy. It is the only thing that makes fiction work. 
Fiction would not work at all if you didn't care about the people. And yet we read, so you read a book, you read a novel, and you know, right, we all know these people are fake, they're not real, it didn't happen, right? And yet, we respond viscerally, and I, I mean that literally, we respond in our bodies. It's not just our brains thinking, oh, these are interesting thoughts, right? We laugh out loud sometimes if something funny happens. Our hearts pound when something scary happens to the character. You're literal, it gets your heart, literally. Your heart is pounding. You, you, um, you become tense, you sit tensely when you're reading because you care. It literally affects our bodies. We're responding that powerfully to the empathy, to what, what we care about in the stories. So if that's happening, then imagine the kind of bridges that that empathy is crossing. So let's say, I do this visually. This over here is you. This is your life, your gender, your age, your background, your so all the categories, all the demographics that make you you. That's you over here. And let's say you read a novel about somebody who is exactly like you, except they're 10 years older or younger in age. So they're over here. Well, that's a little bridge, but you've just built a bridge of empathy to that life that is not yours. But let's say they're um, different in age and they live in another country. Well, that's a pretty big bridge. Okay, so now we're over here. Now, go, now you read Toni Morrison's Beloved about an escaped slave woman, right? And, and look at the size of these bridges between, you know, your, so this woman back in history with an experience that, you know, no one alive uh, now um, has lived. And the bigger the bridges are, I think, the safer we are. And I, I um, don't have the exact quote, but Toni Morrison said something like, if you know something about my life, you're less likely to kill me. Now, if we can empathize with each other, we're not only less likely to do horrible things to each other, but what we're less likely to stand by, to think, well, those, those people, we know they're real, but they're not as real as we are. They're not as real as our loved ones are. If you can empathize, and if your heart can beat faster because of something happening to someone else, then you cannot ignore them, and you can't turn a blind eye. And that's how I think fiction makes the world safer. And there's a, a project, there's some work that I am starting to do with some other writers. Um, I don't know if anyone here has read Jessica Shattuck's beautiful book, The Women in the, in, the, Women in the Castle. Uh, Jessica's in my writing group. I had not known her well. We'd been in the same writing group for about a year. I knew part of her family was German. And then she published an essay in the New York Times titled, I Loved My Grandmother, But She Was a Nazi. And um, I thought, okay, you know, I said to Jessica, okay, your grandparents were Nazis. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. If we don't talk about this, it becomes the thing we never talk about. So let's go out to coffee. <laughs> that's, it was about 90 awkward seconds and then just the gates opening of what it was like for each of us to grow up in the shadow of that. We wrote a piece together and we started doing interviews and NPR interviews together and traveling around with it some and people calling in saying, I have an oil painting of my grandfather in his SS uniform in the attic and nobody wants it. What should I do with it? So I, I let Jessica take those questions. But just talking about, you know, how do we have the conversation and how do we bring that, that um, you know, do you humanize Nazi characters? Can you, could, do, do we have to act like all Holocaust survivors were perfect, flawless people, or can we let them be real people with flaws? And what does it mean to do that through the arts? And I'm doing a project now with Julie Lindahl, who wrote The Pendulum, um, a memoir of growing up and discovering that her grandfather was in the SS, and trying to bring um, writers across, we're, we're trying to, to start this initiative to bring writers across these gulfs of history to talk about, do cultural tolerance work through the arts um, so that we learn something from history um, and hopefully make the world safer, which comes back to the political campaign that you're gonna run, right, <laughs> when you run for office. Um, thank you very much, that's a whole lot out of me, so I'm delighted to have conversation. I loved your book. Um, I couldn't put it down. I would love to see it made into a film. I don't know if that's occurred to you. This, the, the, love story, the love story between Helen and Dror was so poignant and felt very cinematic to me. I, I don't know if you could speak to possibly an inspiration about that. And the other thing that was this the whole concept of um, martyrdom and Masada and these other and and um, Esther's voice, mm -hmm. um, her particular pat, what what her philosophy is, her pat was passion, mm 
And so I'm wondering if those are a lot of things, but possibly maybe you could pick something to speak to. <laughs> sure. Well, I, thank you. I would love it if someone made a film. Uh, so maybe. if anybody has any connections, let's uh, <laughs> come talk to me. Um, um, and thank you. So, so it's interesting you mentioned the notion of the uh, Masada and martyrdom. So I was uh, discussing this a little bit over dinner. There is a, something that used to play a much bigger part in the novel that I then turned the volume down on in later drafts. But um, the initial uh, opening quote of the book right now is just the Shakespeare. Um, uh, nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it. That quote used to be side by side with a quote from the speech Eliezer made on top of Masada. Um, and the quote was, um, let us now do for ourselves, our wives, and our children a kindness while it is still possible to do ourselves any kindness, a kindness being mass suicide. So um, one of the original inspirations for writing this, uh, there, were, there were two, and I, I cheated. I only talked about one earlier, but you found me out. Um, so was the Virginia Woolf, uh, Shakespeare's sister, but the other one was the two women atop Masada. Because we all grew up, I mean, how, how many of us heard the Masada story as kids or growing up, right? Most American Jews hear the story of the, the martyrdom and, um, you know, 70, uh, the year 70, uh, and the, you know, the Romans closing in and a small band of Jews and everybody's closing in on them. And then the, the, rather than let the Romans come and kill them and enslave them, they chose mass suicide. Um, and uh, we all grow up hearing this story, you know, Masada w will not fall again. We know the quote uh, that Eliezer, the leader of the Jews, used to exhort the men to mass suicide, to convince them to do it. Um, and the story, it's like atmospheric. We just accept it, that we have it, but how do we know it? How do we supposedly know what Eliezer said if everybody died? Right? And the answer is, it's a little footnote in the story that there were two women who didn't die. They chose to hide in a cave with some children and choose slavery, compromised life, rather than martyrdom. And they told their story to Josephus, and Josephus wrote it in the Jewish Wars uh, in his book, and that's how we have that. And um, this notion, I mean, I grew up with this, this Masada story, and if the women were mentioned at all, they were mentioned as traitors and cowards. And that always bothered me. So that's the other thing that got me started writing this book. What, what did that mean, that we say that someone who chooses life rather than martyrdom is a traitor or a coward? And yet, just, you know, we have this big story of Masada and this little watermark in history. We have these two women voting with their feet something else. We'll take compromised life. We will take the desire for life um, rather than the principle that we're going to die for. Um, and I didn't want to write a story set all the way that far back in history. I figured 17th century was far enough back to try to figure out dialogue and what they wore and what they ate and everything. But that story was embedded in my novel to the degree that um, it was the opening quote. The working title of the book for 10 years was Kindness, from that quote, until my agent finally convinced me that if I called the book Kindness, it would be mis misshelved in self-help, along with <laughs> optimism and hope and love. Right. Kindness. Um, and I was like, but it's the best title because it has the double meaning. She said, yeah, you know it has a double meaning. No one else is going to. She was absolutely right. Um, and then I had a very bad attitude about finding a new title. We went through maybe 50 options. I used to carry around a piece of paper that had all the different options we considered. At a certain point, I, I wrote to my agent. I said, we're just going to call it Bookie McBookface because I can't consider any more titles. And then my editor said, how about the price of ink, the cost of ink? And you know, we came up with that. Um, but and, and so um, I reduced the presence of the Masada story in the novel to just the, the fact that the etching is on Helen's um, mantle. And then something else that was in, the, in my idea from, of the book from the beginning, that there would be two women who refused martyrdom. And without doing any spoilers, those who have read the book, the, um, that scene on the street during the plague and the choice that um, Esther and Rivka make, those are my two women who hide in a cave. Um, and so that stayed in the spirit of the book. Well, before uh, Deborah asks a second question, I have a question. And uh, well, it's not really a question. It's uh, when we announced that you were going to be here th tonight, many people came up to me during high holiday services when, when we announced it and said, I love that book. I'm so happy that you're bringing Rachel Kadish to um, Santa Barbara. Uh, 
So I would like to know, I want someone to be really quite honest. We've had two people who began their questions to you by saying, I love the book. But would anyone else want to tell, tell me or tell us why you love this book so much? Oh, oh we, got a, we got a hand back there. No. <clears throat> Come on up here. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Stephen. I'm the coordinator for the Jewish Book Club of Congregation B'nai B'rith. And I chose your book because, well, for the reasons I'm about to state, but I was amazed that 33 people showed up for our Jewish Book Club and almost everybody had read your book. And our wonderful professor, Lynn Batten, a professor emeritus UCLA, uh, facilitated a discussion that no one really wanted to stop. I think we probably could have kept it up all Sunday. It, mm. was, it was an amazing discussion with lots of praise for your work. Um, I loved the book for so many reasons, uh, one of which was the incredible lyric quality of your prose. As a matter of fact, I found myself many times, I'm a little bit tearful here, many times just stopped cold by the, the beauty of your prose and, and unable to continue reading. And then I had to think, I'm here, I'm sitting in a chair, I'm a reader, I'm reading a book of fiction. The, the story isn't going to continue unless I keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I moved on. Um, but it, it is just wonderful. And I will reread re your book many times because of oh the God. prose alone. It's just so gorgeous. It's so moving. Um, and I had some other experiences that um, amazed me. Um, the, 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 the visceral presence of the characters. I don't think I've ever read a book where I've actually felt as though I've inhabited the characters' bodies and the physical experiences that they were having, whether it was slogging through the streets or burning themselves or the fatigue of, of handwriting a page. I felt like I was in their bodies, and I've never had that experience in a novel before. Um, the third thing that brought me uh, again and again back to some of the pages was the interaction of some of the characters where it, it really felt like they didn't know what they were going to say in their speech, like it wasn't a fiction writer putting words into their mouths, but they were in engaged in an act of discovery, and they were at times fraught, amazed, pushed to go on. Um, your your uh, relationships that you drew were just scintillating for mm -hmm. me. Thank you very much. My goodness. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's, That's wonderful. That is wonderful. <laughs> Tremendous. Thank you.